You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for April 3rd, 2020. It's not safe for work. Coming to you live from the Cornfield Resistance, which has been pants-free since 2010, it's The Professional Left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Hey, Drift Glass. Hey, and now, a little culture. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. When in April the sweet showers fall that pierce March's drought to the root and all, and bathed every vein in liquor that has power to generate therein and sire the flower, when Zephyr also has with his sweet breath filled again in every holt and heath the tender shoots and leaves, and the young sun his half course in the sign of the ram has run, and many little birds make melody that sleep through all the night with open eye. So nature pricks them on to ramp and rage, then folk do go on pilgrimage, and palmers to go seeking out strange strands to distant shrines, well known in distant lands. And specially from every shire's end of England, they to Canterbury went, the holy blessed martyr there to seek, who helped them when they lay so ill and weak. And that is the prologue to Canterbury Tales, which we noticed last night as we were talking that it takes place right at this time of year. Yes, right it at does. the end of March, beginning of April. It does. Uh, it does. People leaving the city to go to Canterbury to be saved from the plague, right? And this was after the plague has sort of swept through London mm -hmm. many times um, right. already. Like over the course of, of uh, Chaucer's life, it had it hit three or four times, four or five times. Mm. And yet, as grim as it was, and, and one, of the, one of the things I understood from reading this on Wikipedia last night, <laughs> which mm -hmm. I don't remember at all from studying this when I was much, much younger, was that the plague sort of wiped out French speakers. Oh, yeah. You know, there yeah. were just Middle English was what was left to work with, you know, more or less as a language. And that this was the first epic really in Middle English. And despite the fact that it's a grim time and and no doubt about it, it's very funny. Even during the incredibly grim time, there were there were writers, especially, well, at least one who were, were looking to the future and writing about the times they were living in 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 full measure. You know, writing about everything that was going on, writing about every class of society, about how everyone was reacting to this from the rich to the poor and putting it in a in a travel story, which is, you know, an ancient and venerable format. It certainly is. Mm -hmm. So uh, we want to thank everyone uh, for writing us this week. We're going to read your letters in just a moment, but we want to let everyone know that we got over 90 letters. We did. 90 emails from people mm -hmm. uh, all across the country and around the world uh, letting us know how you're doing. Uh, there's no way we're going to be able to read or thank everybody who wrote in a week, but uh, we are grateful to hear from you. Yes. And uh, thank you for being there. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting us. And, and we're there to support you, too. Um, we're just so glad to be a part of this Professional left family. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I have to say, though, Drift Glass, that uh, yesterday you were super angry. I was super duper angry yesterday. I was, <laughs> I, there, are, there are a few times in uh, my writing career as a blogger. And by the way, uh, we just passed, I know this is important, more important than anything else on the news, <laughs> anything going on in politics. You know, this is, this really does rise to the level of, of maximum importance. Uh, this last week was my 15th blog anniversary. I've been doing happy blog anniversary, Dirk. Thank last you. 15 years I've blogging. Been, been writing this, you know, I've been swearing into the abyss <laughs> for. And that is on topic as to why you were so angry yesterday. It, it and is, he, does, that... he does not take it out on the family. The, no, no, if, no. If, if something in the news is making him mad, 
he's just mad about it. And... If only I have a platform to explain. Hey, wait a minute, I do. <laughs> I have over forty listeners or forty readers who uh, who appreciate it at least. Yeah. And, and by right. the way, I I had been a rotten correspondent um, going back to my mother passing away, and and then this. I've just been it, pen. The pen feels very heavy in my hand when it comes to writing mm-hmm. letters of thanks, mm-hmm. even though I feel it deep in my heart. Uh, so. Be patient. I, 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 I thank you all a great deal, and I will catch up with correspondence because now I'm indoors for the next month, so I'm sure I'll get around to it eventually. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't get mad. I, I just sit down and blog, and and I've been doing it pretty much every day for 15 years. I've taken a couple of days off here and there, but it's pretty, pretty much steady. And I don't get to the point where I don't know what to write because I'm so angry at what I'm reading. You got there yesterday. I did. And I said <laughs> and to, to my very patient and loving wife, I would like to play for you three minutes of the Bulwark podcast. Now, there, there's so much wrong with that sentence, really. First of all, <laughs> why am I imposing this this never Trumper bullshit podcast on my wife? Right. Right. And Fair I didn't enough. want to listen to it. I, I have to admit, I was like, no, you, it's not bullshit. If you're, your anger is enough for both of us. So you yeah. go ahead. Let me and... read to you from the prologue to Ayn Rand's <laughs> Anthem. <laughs> exactly. It was another moment right. like that. <laughs> Knowing that she can't throw me out of the house anymore because I'm here to stay because we're all together. Um, so I, I, I begged her indulgence. Uh, this is, And then I did. I listened to three minutes of The Bulwark, and we're going to play it for you. Please yes. indulge us yes. because when I heard David Frum saying what he said, yes. it didn't make me angry. It just floored me. Yes. and So and... here's... Can this I play is, David Frum now? Uh, Dave, this is, well, it, it's important. The context is David Frum, the speechwriter for George W. Bush. Right. The man who coined the term axis of evil. Right. The person who wrote a book about well, the glories of the Bush presidency. Being right. Being interviewed by Charlie Sykes. Charlie Sykes, who was the, the Rush Limbaugh of Wisconsin for decades, who mm-hmm. are now both never Trumpers. And, and thanks to having uh, – enormous amount of of high dollar contacts in the media these are people who went straight from the weekly standard uh wherever they were working to having their own blog podcast etc cetera, etc cetera, fully staffed up fully funded etc cetera, etc cetera, overnight these are people who should have disappeared into the woodwork the minute the bush administration collapsed and never shown their faces again but david frum went from from charity case to charity case to now he's an editor at the atlantic and so that's the history of these people these people are Lifelong Republicans, supporters of George W. Bush, people who never barely had a nice thing to say about Barack Obama during the eight years he was president. And then they decided to have a podcast and talk about, isn't it a shame? And we'll just leave it there. David Frum from The Atlantic Magazine. David, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. I appreciate it. It's so good to connect. All right. I want to read to you something that you wrote back in July of last year, 2019. You wrote, when this is all over, nobody will admit to ever supporting it. Well, we've we've had in the past two weeks uh, an appetizer serving um, of that truth. Uh, Look at how not only has have defenders of the president pivoted to say that he did take the uh, coronavirus seriously, that he never called it a flu. Um, they are now outraged when anyone rem- reminds them of what they were saying only six weeks ago. Um, and uh, Donald Trump, in fact, has tried to bring legal action against um, a um, an advertiser who quoted him describing coronavirus as the Democrats' new hoax. I never said that, he says. Well, of course, he did say it. Um, but th- there's going to be a reinvention of the past. And as this crisis plays through the country, as it takes its terrible toll in life and suffering as it takes its ter- terrible economic toll. Um, I, I think we are on our way to seeing Donald Trump leave office, one of the most execrated presidents in American history. And as he does, the people who supported him will then begin to explain, well, I was, ne- I, I was never for Trump. Um, I was against the media's unfairness. I was against media bias. You know, I, I never liked his, his spending. Um, he, obviously, he was never a true conservative. And all that evidence you have of me uh, defending him, you know, that, that's, it's kind of hateful of you to bring that up. That is where we are going. We've had a little appetizer um, in the past few days. More to come. And so after uh, listening to that clip, Jeff Glass, Jeff Glass just couldn't speak for a while. I, I, was, was just... I still, I still don't know how to write about this. I'm so, yeah. 
I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm gratified to have been completely vindicated in that <laughs> the, the Bush off machine, which, uh-huh. you know, I, I wrote about back when George Bush, the Bush administration collapsed, and suddenly all these people were running around trying to exonerate themselves, pretending they'd never heard of George Bush, never supported George Bush, I never voted Republican. That's how all these assholes got out of the righteous judgment of history in the first place. Right. And, and to hear David fucking from. Predict and 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 he is accurately predicting oh, sure. what's going to happen. I don't blame him for accurately no. predicting. It's the blindness to his own being. Yeah. The uh, David Frum and Charlie Sykes and Bill Crystal, who also works there, and all the other conservative um, wiggly wiggly worms who, who mm-hmm. draw a paycheck from the bulwark all exist because they simply pretended the Bush administration didn't exist. And it was somehow very unfair to bring up the fact that these people were supporters of George Bush. And it was somehow very hateful and wrong. I, I've been blocked by Charlie Sykes and by uh, Rick Wilson for bringing up the fact that they created the monster machine that created Donald Trump. They don't want to take any responsibility for that. And so between that podcast where they're they're later in which they're both quoting Hannah Arant to each other what? about how totalitarian <laughs> leaders expect their followers to just fall in line and 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 when the truth is exposed well you know that the totalitarian followers just laugh and say how clever their leaders were like this is that thinking is why you had a fucking job and and the second part of this which I'm not going to get into in great depth because I already wrote about it was that Bill Crystal wrote a a post bill crystal weekly standard bill crystal um iraq war pimp blood soaked mm-hmm. bloody bill crystal wrote a post about uh that david brooks um elevated and prompted and celebrated and clapped and was ratioed to death over um about how ain't it a shame that the republican party went off the rails three years ago ain't it a shame how, wow. how the, the whole conservative and it's a, and he's just saying the conservative movement is over Republican Party's destroyed itself because of what happened three years ago. Not what happened right. 30 years 2017. ago. 2017. You know, the, minute, <laughs> the minute Bill Crystal left the Republican Party, all was lost. That's, <laughs> that's what he would have you fucking believe. And it wouldn't bother me. Really. I sincerely, I'm, I'm absolutely sincere about this. These people wouldn't fucking bother me except every goddamn time I turn on MSNBC, one of these assholes is being given a million dollars in free publicity. While right. liberals who've been right all along starve in the cornfield. And yep. that is what yep. infuriates me because public opinion, mark my words, is shaped by these people. And and if they keep repeating, yeah, the Republican Party just fucked up you know, three years ago. It was three years ago. It was three months, really, but three years ago. Eventually, all those, all those independents out there. All those head nodding, both sides do it, assholes who who only, who don't know follow anything, don't know anything, they just don't want anyone to fight anymore, will all come to somehow agree that, yeah, before Donald Trump showed up, everything was fine. Everything was mm-hmm. just great. And then Donald Trump showed up and magically hypnotized 60 million people into believing uh, terrible things and wrecking the country. No one knows how it happened or why. No one knows what magic ring he has. But that's the story, and we're sticking with it, and everyone in the media will go along with it. It is Mm -hmm. the meta version of the lie that David Frum correctly ascribes to Trump supporters. So they're going to do it, but Crystal and Frum and Sykes and and Brooks and all the rest of them are already doing it Mm -hmm. about their own culpability, their own guilt, and there is no one in the media calling them out on it. There's no there's no bulwark on the left that gets this kind of time these assholes get on my liberal TV right. to say, wait a minute, this is just wrong. This did not happen yesterday. This did not happen three years ago. This happened 30 years ago. And but you Joe people- Scarborough is yeah. the frat house gatekeeper yes. of that. Yes, he is. Of that voice. So, and so yesterday, just to get back to our personal home and so <laughs> forth. And like I said, drift class does not, rail or yell at me or or get mad at the kids this is all internal and and i know when he's upset about something but he really was i don't know how to write this this. i'm so upset Mm -hmm. and i just started singing you know 
my voice versus your voice and it would be like like queen singing Mm -hmm. mama loves podcast (laughs) listeners they send us five bucks and we're ever so grateful and drift glasses charlie sucks charlie sucks charlie sucks sucks. (laughs) (laughs) david brooks no i will not let him go (laughs) crystal will not let him go no and and we did that for about a day and that yeah, was, was pretty and, funny. And the kids were like, "Can we leave now? Can we go yeah. someplace where <laughs> this doesn't happen? Outside? No, Anywhere, you really? Cannot. <laughs> Anywhere doesn't matter where a crowded room. We don't care. But anything's better than this. So, so uh, that's life around the uh, the bunker here at yeah. at Casa DGBG. Just so you're aware that there's moments there's moments when people get upset, but uh, mm-hmm. Drift Glass is a good guy and a good stepdad and a good husband and. He and takes deep breaths, and I too. we we monitor each other's blood pressure. Yes, we, literally we do. Literally, <laughs> literally. We do. <laughs> we've been um, told to do that. So, uh, well, and let's let me just uh, take the opportunity to talk about the other half of this story, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Um, because it, this this is the moment where you know, which happens all all the time on this podcast, where we say, "See, see, we told you, we told you this is going to happen. We told you, we told you." Uh, among the never Trumpers. The conservative movement spontaneously and inexplicably went mad, went nuts three years ago. That's the mm-hmm. that's what we just talked about. This is their lifeboat. This is how they're going to get out of it. So what about all the Trump supporters? This, we're just now talking about all the people on the right. How are the people on the right sustaining their um, ecosystems? And the never Trumpers are like, it all happened three years ago. Before that, no one knows what happens and we're all innocent. Among Trump well, supporters. Well, can I just comment briefly, very briefly, sure. that – I had a viral tweet this morning, uh, and it was my old line that podcast listeners very well know that Donald Trump got more primary votes yeah. in the Republican primary than any other candidate in history. Yes. And they like him because he's not a politician, mm-hmm. and they should have their teeth drilled by not a dentist. Right. And it was in the context of Jared Kushner being, you know, the idiot son-in-law who's been put in charge of the coronavirus yes. response. So. Yeah. And the replies that I got from the right, because it went viral and apparently it was linked by somebody somewhere yeah, on yeah. the right. And their memory of every imagined Barack Obama crime. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They have a. Is, you know, encyclopedic. the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted yeah. and they have a they have a sermon ready to tell you about all of the crimes of Barack Obama. Oh yeah. That's in their so, back pocket at all times. And, right. Right. And as we've said before in this podcast, every wing nut is a PhD in civil rights history right up until 1964. <laughs> yes, and then it gets right. very mysterious what's happened until then. Then Barack Obama came along and ruined America. And, mm-hmm. but they, they are capable of retaining information. The problem is the information they retain are lies. And they keep forgetting that we debunked this once, twice, three, four, five times ago, because they're all um, RAM and no hard drive. They just reboot whatever the firmware said, you know, and like, wow, well, Barack Obama, remember when he uh, he shot all those people? And he wore that, of money to Iran. Yeah, and that tan <laughs> suit, that was pretty bad. And that beer summit, that was, he called that cop stupid. And yeah. that's all they fucking remember. And and yeah, I'm not surprised. I, I, uh, I did not quite as go as viral as you. I did wash my hands afterwards because that's what one does. <laughs> but I did... I did say on the Twitter something um, rather cruel and crude and, a- and honest, and they swarmed. But it really is this. They are all cornered rats at this point. There's mm-hmm. no place for them to go. So what do you do if you're a Trump supporter? Well, you advance the lie. And I, I, I wrote a long post about this, tracing the epidemiology of this lie, because it's interesting, is that Democrats caused this to be a catastrophe because of impeachment. Oh, yeah. That was a big meme this week. It was. Yep. And it was launched on Fox News mm-hmm. and then repeated and then repeated again and then repeated by uh, uh, Human Events magazine, uh, including the fact that Barack Obama didn't ever prepare anyone for any of this. And then it was picked up by Sean Hannity. And then Hannity with the – because Sean Hannity now basically runs fucking Fox News. I mean, whatever he wants to do. There's nobody in charge anymore except him. So he just does whatever the fuck he wants. So he advanced this lie. And then it, it became necessary to pass this contagion, which is now every wing that agrees. It, it would have been bad, but it's a tragedy. It's going to be a catastrophe because Democrats something, something impeachment. So what's the new big lie? Well, you need to pass that into the general public. You need to pass that along to the news media. So enter Newt Gingrich. And then enter Hugh Hewitt. 
and then enter Rich Lowry, all of whom signed on with some variation of something, 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 Democrats, impeachment, that's the real crime here. Maybe Republicans screwed up, but Democrats screwed up too. They, they sap the nation's vital bodily fluids with impeachment or they distracted. And you can put up the timeline of events that show this is bullshit. You can remember that Bill Clinton actually ran the country while he was being impeached. You can throw all this shit at him. It doesn't. Well, the number but, of rallies and golf games Donald yeah. Trump played, mm-hmm. you know, right after impeachment. And, and yep. the, the object, the purpose of this whole huge propaganda machine showed up in our newspaper couple days ago, when a local wing nut got his letter published in the, in the op-ed page going, Democrats should have impeached the impeachment of the Democrats. That's the real problem. The Democrats don't want to remember that. I'm like, that's the end product. That's, that's what comes out of the sphincter at the end of the machine. The whole purpose of having this massive, well-funded propaganda, toxic wing nut propaganda machine is to have idiots like that repeat bullshit like that to their friends and neighbors on Facebook and take it as gospel. And then you debunk them, by which point they are off to lie number two or three or four or five, which have all come through the machine. And so the big lie among never Trumpers is this all happened three years ago. The big lie among uh, Trump supporters is Democrats impeachment is the real problem. That's the real crime. And they have an extremely powerful, both both have very powerful propaganda engines. Uh, We don't. We have a little podcast, but we do tell the truth. And that should count for something. I want to talk about uh, coronavirus and testing for a moment because um, a, a number of people, uh, wise people, et cetera, have been saying, you know, what we really need is a lot of testing. And I agree with that. We need mm-hmm. testing. People need to have some sort of security that they either have it or they don't or that they're carriers or they're not. Mm-hmm. Uh, that said, I think it's really important to remember that we are all in this together. Mm hmm. And I don't like the idea of testing to divide us. Uh, Can you imagine if we tested and found that there's a hot spot at a synagogue? Right. Or there's a hot spot showing that, God forbid, Muslims are carriers in a certain specific city. Yeah neighborhood right that that is what that is where there's a you know patient 31 right Mm -hmm. uh we're already seeing some of that there was an attack on a nurse yesterday uh where someone was had literally attacking her on the street because she was bringing coronavirus home from the hospital i mean Mm -hmm. this kind of fear and hatred and our country is just at a point where the, the amount of racism that has been allowed to – that has been indulged from the very top mm-hmm. is dangerous. Yeah. And, and so I th- want testing, but I also uh, find it very interesting that the, the white neighborhood of New Rochelle, New York, had a dome put over it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a barricade. And yet we remember how African Americans were treated during Katrina. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. you can't cross this bridge. We're yeah. going to put up a barricade. Right. Black people are looting. White people are foraging for food. Right. You know, the standards and, and the media doesn't know when they're being racist. I mean, no. this is just uh, the the blind spot of being white, overwhelmingly white and yes. overwhelmingly blind to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, to their bias is remarkable. So yes, we need testing, but this is something, uh, and I I also want to say, and people are starting at, in governors are starting to say this, our governor in Illinois has started to say this, that those who stay at home are serving. They're serving in the fight against this. And it is important to appreciate the sacrifice that all of us are making. This is this is not not the sacrifice that people made in World War II or during the Depression. Uh, but I think we've gotten used to, uh, with the Iraq War, it only being a few of us who have to sacrifice. Right. You know, and why should everybody have – you see the, hear this on Fox News today. Why should everybody have to suffer just because a few people are sick? That, that was a comment made today by a Fox News personality. So uh, this is all of us. It's all of us together. And uh, that's the way it has to be, because the consequences of making it one group of people is uh, too horrifying to consider, I think. Well, and I mean, there are very few good analogies available to people who think in analogies like I do sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know enough about the the pandemic. Uh, there's no World War One. There's no, you know, the, the world is a different place. Uh, the Spanish flu, I mean, Spanish influenza. But yeah, yeah. Um, World War Two did have the effect, at least for a while, of democratizing um, everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mm-hmm. did have, you know, people like Jimmy Stewart flying bomber missions. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, people were expected. It was just expected that, well, the country is in peril and we're going to all step up and do something about it. And, you know, that, that what did, uh, I, I forget the exact quote, but it was about, um, from it's a wonderful life, you know, Mr. Potter, because all the rats weren't in Germany or something like that. You know, mm-hmm. some people had to stay home because all the rats weren't in Germany. Um, it is it is so much less to ask of us than we're asked of our parents and grandparents. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the, the stakes are so much higher because if this runs out of control, tanks will not solve it and battleships won't solve it. Right. Although I'm sure Donald Trump will attempt to nuke it at some point. Mm. Um, and it is, it is something that you can solve with math and science. You don't need to throw bodies on Normandy beach. You just need to ob- obey scientists flat yeah it requires curve. expertise which is very threatening to the right though yes it absolutely you don't, don't have to listen to laura ingram for five minutes no. to realize that expertise is the enemy well however um, there there are some areas of expertise that should not think outside of their own area of expertise for example <laughs> yes. um let's say you're an astrophysicist which is a very prestigious job and you decide you want to uh you want to figure out a cure or a warning system for coronavirus. You're an astrophysicist. You get a degree or two or three or four in physics, in, in, in astrophysics. What do yeah. you do? What do you do? Well, first of all, you you should ask someone about that. And then they'll ask, is your degree in epidemiology or biology or anything having to do with this at all? And the answer is, if the answer is no, then go back to looking at the stars because that's a great thing for you to do. But <laughs> well, no. Now, now, to be fair about this astrophysicist, uh-huh. go ahead and tell tell everyone what he did. He decided that to test his hypothesis, it, uh, he would stuff magnets up his nose. He put magnets up his nose and it did not work out very well for him. No. Um, what he was trying to do was invent a necklace mm-hmm. that would remind you that you're touching your face. Right. Which is fine. And that's fine. But having a magnet in your nose was part of his hypothesis. Mm-hmm. And um, he put two magnets in his nose and they magnetized to each other across his septum and got mm-hmm. stuck. So he decided that he would put one more magnet up his nose to catch the other magnet. Right. Because that'll do it. <laughs> And then he had three magnets up his nose, mm-hmm. and then he had to go I to the doctor. I gotta go doctor. I gotta go doctor <laughs> now and get the magnets out my nose. So you know there are, there are people working on this problem. Not this guy, but, right? You know he tried. Give him that. He tried. He, he said, "You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking magnets up the nose. That that but might." But he, ta- he taxed our healthcare system, um, yes. or the British healthcare. I forget whether he was in Britain or Australia or where mm-hmm. he was, but he he. He should not have done that. And please don't no. put magnets up your no. nose. No. It's not going to help. No. And and don't drink uh, aquarium cleaner. No. And, and, don't gargle you know, with bleach. Don't gargle with bleach. There are just it's, things you just don't things. need to do. You know what don't, you could do? Don't do these. Wash you your wash, hands. Wash your hands for 20 seconds or more. Uh, wipe down your groceries when you get them. And, stay at uh, home. Stay at home. And, uh, and just listen to the Professional Love Podcast. We have 540 go. episodes of this shit. You can listen to us for for weeks and never. And of course, you'll hear me say the same shit over and over again if you listen right. to it too much. Well, that's the secret. I'm not really even here. Class, let's read it. Let's read some letters. Let's do that. Uh, a listener wrote to us and said, uh, under the heading "I am not okay," and I wanted mm-hmm. to start with this one because I don't want to be all roses and sunlight. Uh, it's important to realize there are people struggling, and uh, uh, we're with you on that. Um, This person wrote and said, I am, was the breadwinner for our family. I am 60 years old and I can't even wrap my brain around having to start all over at 60. Coronavirus, whatever. Right now, I would kiss a coughing stranger to get my job back. Seriously. Mm -hmm. On the silver lining of the equation, we are financially okay for now. Mentally, not so much. So you asked what you can do. I am a longtime listener, so I know that Drift Glass is no stranger to layoffs and job loss. Uh Please tell me what in the fuck I am supposed to do. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, let me gather myself. If you could, please take a moment in your next podcast and step into the role of leader and answer the question Donald Trump refused to answer. What do you say to Americans who are scared? Mm -hmm. Or more to the point, would you have any advice or words of comfort for the 3.3 million of us that have had just had the rug pulled out from under us? Or now 10 million. Yeah, and I did have an uh, email exchange with this person. One thing that this listener is struggling with, and I totally get it, is uh, COBRA yes. health insurance yeah. is ridiculously expensive. It, yeah, I remember that. Yep. Uh, yep. Regardless of what Donald Trump says, my understanding is, and I may be wrong about this, but my understanding is if you have faced a job loss, you are automatically eligible for... Uh, open enrollment on the Obamacare exchanges. Now, that might not save you money over COBRA. I know Mm -hmm. uh, this listener was writing to us about, you know how much my COBRA is going to cost for two weeks? And I was able to come back and say, well, our monthly insurance bill is more than that. Yeah. Uh, For four weeks, you know, we pay more than she does for COBRA. That's how expensive our insurance is. And Mm -hmm. uh, I I said, I don't think I said this to her, but, you know, you and I always are able to uh, itemize our taxes because we routinely spend more than 10% of our income on health insurance oh, yeah. and health co- her- health care costs yeah, for everyone. Cause yep. you're, you're, you have asthma. We're both over 55 mm-hmm. and people are on medication and it's expensive and, mm-hmm. and our health insurance is expensive. And yep. yes, our health insurance premiums are not over 10% of our income, but when no. you add up everything else, yep. it is. So, but, but that is something to consider if you're facing a Cobra, you know, sticker shock on that, on that score, check on healthcare.gov, even even though Donald Trump is lying about that. And he's still in court trying to take it all away from us. Yes. Well, that's, that's Uh, probably not not much comfort to you, but um, here's the thing. Um, When I was laid off, I was laid off in the teeth of the great recession. Mm Mm-hmm. I was uh, laid off from a workforce development job, an executive position that I was highly qualified for. Uh, my department no longer exists, and the the administrative district where I used to work in Chicago has ceased to exist. Uh, my spe- area specialty was manufacturing. I, I specialized in a whole bunch of other things, but that and it was oh, so you're an older white guy uh, who got laid off from a job in government um, that specializes in manufacturing. That's the worst thing you could be right now, mm-hmm. because it's the manufacturing sector that's getting hammered. And it's government um, um, systems. And, and this was a citywide layoff. It was, even though my department's budget doubled, uh, they laid off a bunch of people to make room for people who were more politically connected to mm-hmm. land, a place for them mm-hmm. to land. I was one of those people. And uh, the thing is, um, you got to grieve. I mean, I looked yeah. out at a wasteland of people getting getting fired and fired and just layoff after layoff, month after month of this. And like, oh, I'm screwed. There's... N- I will never work again. And you know what? I, that's pretty much true. That's I've had, pretty much true. I've had, I, I've applied for every job I'm qualified for. I'm highly qualified for lots of shit. Um, and I have never since then had a full-time job with benefits. Oh, right. No, not true. I had one for six months and then that department collapsed. The, the yeah. uh, funding dried up and I was gradually laid off. So the first thing you've got to do is grieve. You have to accept the fact that the world has changed. Do you have no control over it? And that is a terrifying thing for, especially when your identity is tied to your job and you, and, and it's a sense right. of pride and you're a breadwinner and that's, this is who you are. And now who, the, who you are has been stolen from you mm-hmm. through no fault mm-hmm. of your own. Right. Then you have to really make solving the problems that are going to come your way, your job. I yeah. assume you're really good at what you did. So you have skills. So your job is to research the shit out of healthcare. And research the hell out of unemployment and go on to websites that uh, are grant driven and find out what funding opportunities are available for people like you, people in small businesses, and hook up with people in your circumstance that are geographically uh, co-located with you so that you can team up on this. One of the great things that was um, available to everyone after the uh, Great Recession or during the Great Recession was there were a whole bunch of people like me in a room together, all kind of panicked and sweaty like I'm going to lose my condo. I'm going to lose my savings. And I did. I lost my condo. I lost my savings. I lost my health care. Mm-hmm. I lost all the material things. I gained a beautiful woman and a beautiful wife and a beautiful family. So I'm up on that deal. 
And uh, when we got married, we lost our uh, food stamps. Yes, we did. I lost my food stamps because your unemployment check was too big. Yeah. So we've been yeah. through this. I mean, we've been through it. Yeah. And, and we've talked about it on this on this very podcast. So my suggestion is, as a leader, know that you are going through something with millions of other people. There is some sense of comfort. I always took comfort in the fact that it wasn't personal. This was some. This is a, a wave. It's a disaster that's rippling across the country, across the world, and you're not being singled out for special treatment. God does not hate you that much, <laughs> and that you have to now use your professional skills to build up a different type of temporary career. And that career is finding the resources around you, finding the people around you and, and helping mm -hmm. others. I got to tell you, helping other people in your circumstances, being able to reach out to them and say, you know what? I, here's the thing. I, I don't, it can't help me, but here's something you could do was enormously beneficial to my heart. It didn't help yep. me uh, uh, financially, but it helped my soul a great deal. And know that this will pass. Um, well, and and I think this this small business payroll protection thing, which there's a lot of controversy about it today. Mm -hmm. It just started today, and uh, Bank of America is only yeah. is limiting it to their customers only who already yeah. have loans with them. Which I think that's going to blow up in their faces. Yeah. But uh, you know, if you if you work for a company that might be eligible for that, and they they have to rehire you immediately, mm -hmm. but they may be able to do that. And that's something to look into for them, for your company, for if you're not the owner of a small business, but you're employed by one. And I, I, I think the definition of small business is something you ought to look up to because yeah. you might be surprised that your business is actually a small business and you don't think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, those are things to do. And I like that idea of expertise and helping others. Yes. If it, it helps change your mindset from victim to someone who is actually making the world a better place. And if I could just brag on my wife for state. one second, uh, as you know, our uh, junior dude who is home from college uh, yeah. has autism. And my wife spent many years uh, when he was a little, little boy before I knew her becoming an expert in autism. And now she knows exactly what questions to ask and exactly where to direct people and exactly the steps to be taken. And the knowledge that she gained, that you gained, beautiful wife, from that experience has been yeah. of en enormous benefit to lots of people. Um, and and I remember sitting on the basement stairs sobbing because mm -hmm. I thought I'd done something to make my son this way. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I wouldn't change anything about him right now. No. I mean, I, well, and that's, you, uh, you say that, <laughs> well, no, you know, I mean, I mean, it turns out you did do something to make <laughs> he's him a 21 year way. old. He's a 21 year old bum, uh, like, yeah. like many 21 year olds, but mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I love him and he's, he's a good guy. Yeah. He's a good uh, guy. And we're homeschooling now. And, and yeah, now, I have so, been able yeah. to. Well, now I'm back to homeschooling him like I did in yeah. middle school, just <laughs> sitting there one step at a time with the Spanish. You've got to get it. All right. All right. You want to uh, read the next letter from someone who yeah, DM'd listen, me? Mm -hmm. A listener DM Blue Gal and, and says, Here's my little something, guys. I'm knee deep in this COVID and, and didn't sign up for it. I got into this field 12 years ago because I love people and caring for them. First, thank you for the sanity you give me every week. I just got done listening to your episode from last week. I'm in tears. I feel like you're my family. We feel that way too. Boy, do we. Um, we count our blessings and you guys are in it every day. I work as a nurse at a big hospital near downtown in an ICU unit that has been transformed into the ICU, un ICU COVID unit for the last few weeks. Tonight I got tested for some minor symptoms as well as my kids. I'm scared that I have it, but I think I'm okay. I'm 33 with two young girls and a wife. Things are very bad and scary where I work. From a worried nurse from deep in the middle country, I urge everyone to stay the fuck away from one another and let's end this shit as well as this president. Once again, thank you, one of your biggest fans. Mind if I take a, a swing at this? Sure. Um, a couple things. First of all, uh, we have a brand new blessing in our extended family. Uh, uh, a little a little creature named Ford was born. Yes, uh, to a couple of days ago, uh, in time for my mom's my late mother's spring ritual of sending a poem around to us kids. Instead of a poem this year, we got a new baby in the family. Yes, he's an uncle uh, again. He, yes, he's adorable. He has more hair than I do, which kind of pisses me off. But that's <laughs> what he's going to do. Um, 
And but in that general universe, so blessings count blessings. Yes, baby count Ford is a blessing. Um, yes. Uh, my brother is a chef at a Good Samaritan Senior Citizen Center, and he's been working marathons. People can't come to the cafeteria anymore. They're in full disaster. They have a disaster prep thing. They've been full of disaster prep thing forever. And his wife is a nurse, and they're taping together masks and and making gowns out of whatever they can. This is in Colorado, and all I can say is, um, you're a hero, a real hero. I'm staying home. That's what I'm doing, but you're saving people's lives. And I know it's scary, and I know it's bad, and I take great comfort in the fact that you're out there on the front line defending people like me and my family. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, We heard from our friend Lee in Mexico, the expat, and he just says, Mis mis amigos, greetings from middle Mexico. Uh, I am frightened, I am angry, I am frustrated, and uh, he has... uh, He's he's back home in Mexico and doesn't have any symptoms right now. The jaraconda and primavera trees are blooming. Oh. So my tree allergies are in overdrive. <laughs> yeah, I know. And yeah. it's like every every breathing possibility makes you think you might have it. That's so hard. We need to get beyond Trump before the dreamers can take us to the future. Yes. That's a really yes. good point. Yes, we and do. he he says Michigan, where he is registered to vote. Mm-hmm. As no excuse absentee ballots, and my vote as an expat is covered by federal election rules for military and the expat population. So he is going to vote the mm-hmm. bastard out. Good for you, uh, Lee. Thank you very much, Michigan voter. Anthony uh, went in a science fiction direction. Imagine that Trump et al. support efforts to combat COVID-19 in states where he won in the last election. You know, where folks have been, quote, good to him. Where you can, where he can expect voting to go in his favor, and block as much as possible efforts in state he knows he will lose, and then October surprise declares a national emergency because of COVID nineteen, and has a policy to control county by county who is allowed to go out in public. Voter suppression at its worst. Is there anything in the history of Republicans that would make us think this would be too much? Uh, no, um, except for the fact that. Uh, there'd be a problem with controlling that population. Right. You'd have to shoot me to keep me from voting in the next election. I'm going to crawl over a broken glass to vote this year. Yeah. Uh, so I don't really give a shit what he has to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there, that would do it. Yeah. That would be that would be the line over which um, we would start having armed conflict in this country. If the, if the tyrant in the White House declared elections are canceled or postponed mm-hmm. to suit him. Mm-hmm. There is no reason why we can't have paper ballots in this country and vote by mail. There's no reason at all other than logistics. The post office is still up and running. Paper mills are still printing. Like we said last week, the the the, the census went out to everybody. Apparently, we managed to do that okay. And although it might mean that the results would be delayed by That's a few days. That's the big thing is that people would have to so adjust what? to the fact. But so what? We had to wait in 2000 for a month, yeah, right? We did. We did. There are and, countries and, where you wait a month to find out the results of an election. Yes. And we, well, we didn't really survive 2000 because George Bush cheated. <laughs> right. But we made it through. We can sit, if we can sit in our homes for a couple of months while this virus sweeps across the world, we can wait a couple of weeks for the election results. Well, and, we can do and that. The, the reason that the election's in November and the inauguration is in January yeah. is because of that, is because yeah. the uh, the Electoral College re- went by horseback yes. to convene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There so, was this thing, this yeah. is all before, before telegraphs, before yeah. internet, before cars. For trains, this was all horseback driven. So the time scales were were written for that with that in mind. And we're going to do right. another episode at some point about voting and about vote by mail and so forth. We will be talking more about that down the road. Uh, mm-hmm. But, all, you know, we I am grateful that elections are in the hands of local officials and state officials yes. and yes. not in chart. I mean, there is a reason why <laughs> it was set up this way. Uh, yes, there is. And I'm grateful for it. All right. Our friend Steve writes, I'm hanging in there. I'm worried about my 84-year-old parents. Yeah, I have an 83-year-old dad, and I'm worried about him, too. I've been doing their grocery shopping for them for some time now. So that keeps them well-distanced, but I worry about what I might bring in. I amuse my general practitioner 
yesterday in a non-coronavirus related phone conversation. How are you doing with this social distancing? He asked me. I told him, hey, I'm a hermit at heart. So I feel like I've been training for this my whole life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then he said, uh, a very good friend of mine is a nurse practitioner who w- lives and works in your area of Illinois. She is currently on day six of quarantine due to COVID symptoms. No test available for her, of course. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, Alan writes, my wife and I are good. She is essential personnel and has to leave the house for work. She's an admin for a medical lab. They starting, they're starting to process kits, which is great news. Thank you. Thank you mm-hmm. to your wife, Alan. Thank we you, thank uh, you, we thank you. appreciate her. Mm-hmm. Our buddy in Germany writes us, and this is the one that sends us that wonderful uh oh, oh, that, yummy, oh, yeah. yummy foods at Christmas. So yes. uh, we do love that food that comes the stolen, the stolen that comes <laughs> stolen. to Christmas. Yes. And and this writer starts with I live in a sane country, thank goodness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've been incensed at events in our country uh, for the last three and a half years. But even so, Trump's deliberate negligence and the support he has among 40% of the U.S. people leaves me speechless. Uh-huh. I always look forward to my Saturday mornings and to listening to you. I'm relieved you and your family are well and able to handle this with equanimity and calm. Yeah. So far, so good. <laughs> As Drift Class yeah. always says, you know, yeah. jumping off the roof of a tall building, every floor, so yeah. far, so good. <laughs> so far, so good. You know, we're going to tackle uh, cutting my hair in a, a couple of days, so get back Shaving to Shaving his that. head, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a, a friend of ours, Jilly Bean, wrote, I am fortunate to be working from home during this time, but as Drift Class mentioned, I'm also cognizant of the ways in which the pandemic will reveal the ways the labor market can and likely will be restructured for better or worse in its wake. As Governor... Cuomo made plain there will be winners, but there will also be losers, whatever each of us does individually in the fight. Very sad and infuriating, and and it probably does not have to be this way or to the extent that it is. By the way, started listening to Science Fiction University, and she's also shared it on Facebook. So thank you, Jilly Bean. Thank you, Jilly Bean. Yes, we have this whole other podcast called Science Fiction University. Again, we were going to do a whole pandemic thing a couple of months ago, but we thought, you know, (laughs) let's wait. And now... Pop pop quiz for you, yeah, blue gal. What's the first pandemic fiction story? Oh my gosh, the first pandemic science fiction story. Uh, just what? What is the first pandemic fiction story? Oh, we don't even go with science. Okay, it's got to be. It's got to be by uh, Poe, Ed Graham Poe. Um, actually, Jack London wrote one. Oh, okay. Uh, but Poe's Poe's good one. That's that's the Mask of the Red Death. No, I would argue. The first pandemic story is the book of Exodus. Ooh. Ooh. See, that kind of shit is what we do on Science Fiction University <laughs> all the time. It makes your nipples hard just thinking about all this smartness that goes into the science fiction podcast. But we're not talking about science fiction right now. We're not talking about we're- nipples either. No. No. <laughs> Leave it in. Leave it in. <laughs> all right. All right. Paul writes, I'm texting with one of my Republican friends and got the usual BS about job creators. Really, you have Republican friends, Paul. (sighs) I mean, yes, we all do. We all have people we have to maintain some sort of relationship with. I get it. Uh, My argument is they are not job creators. I had to tell him that the demand for goods is the job creator. That Mm -hmm. makes us little people the job creators. I had to explain that even if the venture capitalists can give money to anyone to build the best widgets in the world, if there is no demand for them, the business will fail. I went on mm. to explain that this means the job provi- they are job providers, not job creators. That is what has the wealthy so scared right now. They need us so they can make their money. That ended the conversation. That leads me to a sad observation. This is an opportunity opportunity for us to get everything we want (laughs) that Mm -hmm. will never happen because we are so divided we have shut this country down it doesn't matter what the reason is we shut it down if we could get the people to stop fighting there is a message we could send we want health care a living wage clean energy etc they don't like it well who's going to fix your roof who's going to fix your air conditioner who's going to fly your planes fix your planes fix the roads fix the plumbing where are you going to get your food what are they going to do when the grid goes down? Yeah. You get where I'm going with this. We can take care of each other. The rich need us 
far more than we need them. You know who agrees with that? Guy who's buried about two miles from here. Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah. Here's Lincoln. Labor is prior to and independent of capital. Capital is only the fruit of labor and could never have existed if labor had not first existed. Mm -hmm. Labor is the superior of capital and deserves a much the higher consideration. Deal with that. Our pal Steve wrote us that he came back early from Arizona. Yeah, Stephen. Hi, uh, Stephen. Hi, Stephen. I flew back from Arizona early than the, earlier than planned as I was afraid that I might have trouble getting back. As the governor of Arizona is a Republican, they still don't have a stay-at-home order in place for the state. Some cities are taking it into their own hands, however. It's going to be hard for people in the next month or so in Arizona as the temperatures are going to be cool enough that everyone will want to get outside. The triple-digit temps don't really start until May. After watching the governor in Arizona operate, we are so fortunate in Illinois to have a real governor that we can trust. I guess we were due. Uh, I saw his news conference yesterday, and it was impressive. Yes, it was impressive. I'm very proud of our governor. I'm very proud of how uh, Democrats, broadly speaking, are handling this. I'm very proud of the people who – the guy who runs the restaurant that we got our food from last night, who's, who's keeping it open by the skin of his teeth to feed the community. Uh, there's an awful lot of heroes out there. And you hear us bitching and complaining and, and, and shaking our fist about you know David Brooks and Bill Crystal as well we should. But – it's those people. It's it's those people who provide our food and haul our garbage and deliver our mail and, and heal us in hospitals and hold our hands when we're sick and dying who are the real heroes. And they far outnumber the assholes in this world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, finally, Alice wrote us a long letter and she closed it this way. I heard you a lot this week, Blue Gal. I'm grateful. I have a lot to be grateful for. But I also took note that being grateful is my way of responding to grief. And yeah. boy, do I get that. Yeah. There is going to be a lot of grim news, a lot to grieve about. This is just yeah. the beginning. I'm glad to listen to you every week. We're glad to yeah. be here and be able to talk to you too, Alice and everyone. Yeah. Thank you for your letters. Again, we had 90 letters, over 90 letters this week. Yeah. And this is just what I was able to cut and paste quickly and getting ready for the show. So uh, we thank you so much for your letters. I'm sorry if we didn't get to yours, but uh, I still have them in my inbox and uh, yep. we'll continue to read them and get back to you. And mm -hmm. thank you so much uh, for all of that. And, and Drift Class, uh, you noted this week that uh, Joe Biden has a new podcast called Here's the Deal. <laughs> Here's the deal. Here's the deal, <laughs> which I'm so thrilled with. It's, it works on so many levels. <laughs> Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank Joe. Uh, he got off to a great start by choosing our podcast host, he, Buzzsprout. He did. He chose the same podcast uh, host company, Buzzsprout, yeah. that we have. Uh, we love their customer service. So good job, Biden people, right? So now now Buzzsprout has those two podcasts on it, <laughs> and you can get them both but for nothing. I'm pretty sure that Joe doesn't have advertisers yet. Uh, secondly, uh, speaking as podcast veterans, one of the original podcast veterans, 10 years in the business. Let me tell you. Let me tell you a few, few, few You're tips. You're going to give him go. some free advice, right? Free advice. <laughs> free advice. And then then contact us because we're going to make your, your shit fly. It'll make it sound. <laughs> um, your show should be either called Biden. Biden, exclamation point. Yeah. Or, or biding your time with Joe Biden. Oh, Lord. Or the Big Fucking Deal podcast. BFD podcast would be a really just, good name for that. It really just would. Saying. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. It would offend some people, but it would offend all the oh, right but people. But hey, it's important. a podcast. It's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Your podcast should not be safe for work, Joe. Now, uh, something you should know, uh, Joe, when you listen to our podcast, and we know that you and your staff are going to. Obviously. Already, <laughs> um, all of the advertisers on our show are fake. All of them. We have no ad support. Our listeners support us enough to keep us roof over our heads. So, but the ad copy we write still sings. So, we would love to write ad copy for you. I would love to hear Joe Biden talk about Casper mattresses and how after you know long train trip on on, to, on Amtrak to Scranton, my ass is killing me. <laughs> you know what makes my ass not kill me? Goddamn good light sleep on Casper mattress. That would be amazing. Zip recruiter. <laughs> Zipper crew. You know what? Any idiot can stick their hand in a fishbowl and come up with people who are smarter than who the fuck is running this country now. You know who I'm going to use? Zipper crew. Stuff like that. Hello Fresh. You're stuck at home. Fuck you. So are we all. But you know what? Hello Fresh will deliver shit to your door. Why don't you get them involved in your life? 
Blue Apron, See, boom, right? Boom, boom, boom. Blue Apron. <laughs> Come on, man. Working with us here. We will write ad copy for you uh, for a small fee because we don't want to make a uh, contribution to your campaign because that would compromise us when it comes to all that shit. <laughs> so you know how to use a pen and pencil, a pen and paper. You write us a check. A Joe Biden check framed on our wall would go a long way to making three kids in this house send us three dollars and we'll write, we'll write you fake ads. We'll we write will. you three fake ads for three dollars. Mm -hmm. Right, we want Joe. From the desk of Joe Biden, a pen, a, little, a check that says, <laughs> "Trust me, I will dine out on that for months." <laughs> We'd like to point out that among the hilarious things that happen on TV, this and it's all unintentionally hilarious, unless you're watching. Tales of Wells Fargo, uh, which I am, and it's, a, it's, it's got problems. Let me tell you, from the 1960s, um, there, all the humor you're going to find on television is unintentional. So, unintentional funny, Rick Stengel on MSNBC talking to Nicole Wallace, remembering that George Bush never politicized 9-11 in any in way. In any way. He never politicized 9-11 in any never way. Never did. Never invaded the wrong country. Never lied us into the wrong war. His vice president never said, basically, vote us back into office or your children will die. That None of that ever happened. Because, you know what? It's illegal to remember anything that happened before Donald Trump existed. Because right. at that point, you start asking questions about, why the fuck is this person on television? And that person. And anyway, we've already done that riff. But it was hilarious to see him disappear from sight under the number of comments they were being piled up in yeah. Twitter stream. Yeah. Um, so way to go, Twitter. Twitter's a sewer, but sometimes it's a useful sewer. Um, I don't know if you want to go through the I don't. Highlight. <laughs> well, let's just put it this way. Uh, the Donald Trump Daily Pity and Vengeance Party yeah. uh, is like the coronavirus in that it gets exponentially worse by the day. And apparently no one in the network has any viable idea how to make it stop. You could turn the cameras off. They you are they away. are turning the cameras off from time to time. When the My Pillow yes, guy came on, they turned it yeah. off. When when Jared came on yesterday, MSNBC cut cut mm -hmm. the camera off. Uh, they could do that much much more. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, the the idea that the federal backup of stockpile is our stockpile not the state's stockpile that's ours, that's our stockpile that, and you know who else believes that jared believes that no that's what he said that's what jared yeah. said i'm quoting jared yeah this is trump, our stockpile trump this week says states should have been building their own stockpiles we're a backup we're not an ordering clerk oh and by the way just today i believe in the washington post it, it pointed out that the the ministry of truth had altered the uh the website the, the the CDC website or, or whatever the appropriate thing is to comport with the lie that Jarrett was telling. Oh, Lord. Because, you know, if you control the present, you control the past. You control the past, you control the future. Orwell was right. And Jared's in charge of that now. Last last week, we did warn that Liberty University, that apparently mm -hmm. it was Jerry Falwell's plan to turn Liberty University into a uh, coronavirus hotspot. And he succeeded. He did. He brought everybody back. And by Friday, there were symptoms and students. And as a Sunday night, one of the students tested positive. They to Canterbury went. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitties are Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Who's on first? Nobody. They're self-isolating. Our listener and friend Pam sent Bud and Lou to us. And she adds, I had to adopt these pair bonded kittens last fall. Had to, because the shelter wasn't going to split them up and they were feral rescues who would have had to wait a long time for a home. I couldn't let them grow up in a cage and they have repaid me by staying kittens for a ridiculously long time, the little sweethearts. <laughs> And, of course, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello eat freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. And, Drift Glass, I have created a monster with this song. Yeah, I know. I poured freshly poured cat food for Barack Hussein the Kenyan usurper and Olive our two black cats yesterday and I sang this song and they were eating the food and the song was over and they stopped eating and looked up at me and I had to start singing the song again for that I said what is this is this is not you musical that, chairs <laughs> you hear that Joe you hear that Joe Biden that's the power 
of of blue gals jingle writing jingle writing you, i can write jingles mm-hmm. oh my gosh so just saying yeah Pay attention joe biden freshly poured freshly poured oh my lord it's freshly poured so you can visit bud abbott and luke costello at our facebook page or website they're very sweet kitties and you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address proleftpodcast at gmail.com where you can also write to both of us feel free to write us we love hearing from you and all of you, we love hearing from you. We were overwhelmed by the number of emails we got and so grateful to hear from each of you. We were. Sorry. And if you didn't get yours read, we do apologize. Yeah. But time. we read them. We just didn't have time. time. To we don't them. have time to air them because the show has to be about an hour if if my sanity is going to, <laughs> yeah. to be maintained. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Oh, letter now on more here. than ever. Yep. Now yeah. more than ever. Uh, all the shipping people, all the delivery people, we love you. Unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage at the drive through for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. We know times are tough, but if you are able to help support us, uh, we do appreciate it. Uh, see our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information, Patreon, etc., is all there at proleftpod.com. And please share our show on social media. We do appreciate that. That does help us. And uh, thank you for doing that. You can also rate or review the show on iTunes, that helps us a lot as well. If you have time on your hands, we would appreciate a rating and review on iTunes. Thank you. We would. Mm -hmm. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties were Tiger Kings before Tiger King was cool. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the wine and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020. DGBG Productions.